Amen. Amen. So we're talking about dynamic encouragement today. And encouragement is literally to um, give courage to someone. Um, We all have people like this in our lives, right? We all have, some of us have more, some of us maybe not as much. And the early church, they had a guy like this. They had someone that was just an awesome encourager. And we're going to go through the book of Acts today as we get to know this guy a little bit. It said, Joseph in Acts 4.36 Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Literally, this is natural for him. This is, he was born into this. And, and he brought courage to people. He brought the best in people. People were excited to be around him. And if I could take a, a side note for you today, if you want encouragement in your life, if you really want encouragement in your life, one big thing that you have to understand is it's a two-way street in every way. Some of you, you want to receive encouragement so badly. You want it in your life so much. But what you have to understand about encouragement, if you're wanting more encouragement in your marriage, you have to understand it's a two-way street. If you're wanting more encouragement with your kids, you have to understand it's a two-way street. If you're wanting more encouragement in your job, in any other situation in life, you have to understand that it is a two-way street. And when you find yourself in a place where you're giving encouragement to others, you will also find yourself in a place where God has sent people your way to encourage you in the times that you need the most. So I want to let that be an encouragement to you today as we talk about it. And we're going to talk about three things that encouragement, encouragers do for our life and one thing that encouragers just do all around. And the first thing today is they support God's work in us. This is on your fill in here. They support God's work in us. It says in Acts 4.37 that this son of encouragement sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. See, what we have to understand, and this should be on your screen, is that encouragers, they bless us with words and reliability. In the sense of baptism, um, you saw it on the announcement videos, we have an awesome opportunity for all of our newly saved fathers in this church, all the fathers that have all the people, all the fathers that have just recently given their life to Jesus, you're going to have an opportunity on Father's Day to baptize your family, your spouse, your kids. And that's such an amazing opportunity. And not only are you going to be able to encourage your family by doing that, but you're going to be able to encourage other fathers to do the same. And it's going to be one of the biggest challenges and one of the biggest moments of encouragement that we've ever seen in our church. It's going to be awesome and amazing. In a sense of Discover Coastal, July 3rd at 945 in the Connection Building, we would love for everyone who has been coming to Coastal recently, who's been checking us out, who's been coming for a while to join us for that Discover Coastal because it would be such an incredible encouragement to you. There is where you'll find, where you'll discover the vision for this church, where you'll get to know this place on a level that's beyond a Sunday morning service, that you'll get to know what the history here and why we do the things we do and why our people are the way they are. And ultimately, when you discover the vision of this place, you'll take a gifts test so that our pastors and our directors can do what they have been called to do, and that's to encourage your gifts and talents that God has given you. In turn, you will encourage people by reaching kids, by reaching students, by reaching adults in small groups, in services, by feeding, by serving, by holding doors, by running cameras, encouraging people in such a way that the Gulf Coast will be saved. But more importantly, these last things I don't, the last two things I just said, they really don't matter if you don't do this part of encouragement. And that's in the sense of you yourself. Allowing Jesus to encourage you by reading the Bible and talking to him every day and surrounding yourself with people that have the same goal so that you can encourage each other. That, more than anything, is the place where you can find yourself in dynamic encouragement where you're being supported with God's work in you. The second thing that encouragers do for our life is they believe the best in us. Acts 9, 26 through 27, I've got a couple of verses here that's kind of lengthy, but it says, when he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he was really a disciple. But Barnabas took and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul, on his journey, had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly and in the name of Jesus. Barnabas believed in this guy 
named Saul. He believed for the best in Saul. And, and this is on your screen. This is important for us to know when it comes to dynamic encouragement is that encouragers risk vulnerability in order to be obedient to God. Barnabas, he willingly took in this, like, this hot-headed Pharisee. Um, he took a risk on him who had ended up being an incredible encourager himself. And we'll learn more about that as we continue in the, nine, the dynamic summer series. He reached out, he brought salt to the disciples, and vouched for him in a way that they remember being vouched for themselves. He risked some, invo- risked some of the vulnerability, obeyed God by being the encourager that he was called to be. This is dynamic encouragement at its finest. I'll share this story with you when I, some of you know that I love basketball. I know all of you are like football fiends, but I'm telling you, basketball is the best sport. I don't care what you say to me, okay? And so what happens is, like, I, I moved to Kansas City uh, right after living in California for a long time, and I grew up playing baseball. That was just the thing to do out there. And so when I get to California, or get to Kansas City, I'm in the south side on the Missouri side of Kansas City, and basically, I, uh, I discover basketball. I discover this great institution called the University of Kansas, and they have an amazing basketball program, y'all. And so what happens is, like, I, I have to find, it, it gets cold. This is the first time I've ever seen snow in my life. And so, like, it gets cold, it gets snowy, so I have to learn how to find a sport to play when it's cold outside. And so I pick up basketball, I'm watching Kansas, it's easy transition. And at this point in time of my life, I'm the tallest kid in my class. I was honestly not much shorter than I am now. And so what happens is I'm here in seventh grade, I pick up basketball, it's fun, it's awesome. Really, I got picked because I was tall. Like my tryout was Loserville at its finest. We had to run full court and do a layup. I could not dribble. I breathed really heavy when I ran a long way and I didn't know how to do a layup. And so all of those are complete failures, but somehow, some way, I still got picked very quickly. And I think it was just because of my height. And so what happens is I actually end up having a good year. Like I said, everybody else was like this tall. And so I, um, I had a, a really good year, made the all-star team, was encouraging for me. But what happened next was a lot of, I guess, discouraging situations. I, did, I set myself up for failure academically in eighth grade. Uh, I actually made the team, but I didn't play a single game that year. I got kicked off the team halfway through the year because I couldn't keep, keep my grades up. And so I remember in eighth grade, I didn't even play at all. Um, and then in the end of the eighth grade, my mom got out of the military. She was a Marine. And so she got out and we, um, we moved to Texas to be closer to our family. And then when we got out to Texas, um, you know, I, I really fixed some things academically. I had some time to just focus on that. And then my freshman year, I made the basketball team. I uh, beat team, but I was on the team, all right? And so I made the basketball team, and I had an okay year. But at that point in my life, I had discovered this phenomenon called fried chicken. And so, like, the fried chicken was not mixing well with the conditioning, right? And so, like, I gained a lot of weight, <laughs> and, uh, and that was just... The struggle was real, y'all. The struggle was real. And so I gained some weight, um, and like I said, okay season. But my family, we really got to a place where, like, honestly, yeah, we were close with our family in Texas, but it just wasn't what it was made out to be, what we thought it would be. And so we moved back to Kansas City. Um, We had a lot of friends that we had gained relationships with there, and, and it was just awesome. We went back to the same school that me and my sisters were in. And I'm in my sophomore year of high school. And I'm getting ready to play basketball, but I really have not, I don't really have a lot of stability at this point. I moved back to the very place where, yes, I just started a couple or a few years before, played at, and then right after that, I failed out in my classes. Then I move away, and then I move back, and then I have a sophomore season that's okay, out of shape still, and I end up failing math and science that spring semester, and I have to go to summer school. And so I find myself in this place where I have not really set up an opportunity for a lot of people to believe in me. Coach Gerke, the varsity head coach, he, he came to me and we sat down in a meeting with Coach Martin and Coach Knight. And he said to me, he's like, Bryce, the only person that's going to stop you from making varsity next year is you. You have enough ability to be on varsity. The problem is you've got to cut the weight. You've got to excel in the classroom. And if you can't do those things. You can't even play on the, you can't even play on the floor. 
And so, and, and all the other stuff, like other things I need to work on as far as basketball, that was secondary to those two, right? And so what happens is that summer, Coach Knight, who always believed in me as my JV coach, he, uh, instead of recognizing me for what I was, a really chunky guy, <laughs> he called me Men Mountain, right? That's a lot more encouraging than the chunky guy. And so he called me Man Mountain literally on the board when he'd write our names in the starters lineup. He'd put Man Mountain. I'm like, yeah, Man Mountain. <laughs> and so all my teammates, they knew what was going on. And so basically that summer, what they had appointed Coach Knight to do was every day after summer school. And they were intentional in that, after summer school, making me understand the priority of a student athlete. Every day after summer school, I would have to go to the gym immediately after, and I'd have to work out with him. He'd run the the mess out of me. I'd have to do jumping drills, plyometrics all the time. I mean, I was was struggling, y'all. He would make me do things like I'd shoot free throws, and if I missed them, I had to run for him. Every single one that I I missed, he'd make me do things I wasn't even good at. He'd make me dribble. He'd make me shoot three-pointers. I wasn't good at that stuff at that point in time. And so what he would do is he would see things in me. He would believe in things within me that I could not recognize myself. From then on, I never failed another class. From then on, I got myself to appropriate playing basketball shape. From then on, I started discovering abilities that I never thought I had and ended up having a great high school career after that because someone believed in the best of me. They spent time with me. They encouraged me. They worked with me. And the thing you have to understand, and this isn't going to open your screen, that encouragers are willing to give people a chance when most would not. Acts 9, 28 through 29 says, So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. So a discouraging situation arises. And then in Acts 9, 30, it says, When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So there's this new follower walking in his talents, walking in his gifts, but new. And the disciples put him in a place where he can win. That's why we have you do the gifts test and discover coastal. And that's what God has called us to do, to help people win, to be dynamic encouragers. Acts 9.31 says it like this, And the church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. Believing for the best in people can absolutely change a community. Believing in the best in your workplace can absolutely change it. Believing for the best in your family, you would be amazed with the attitudes that you would have in your home and how much they would improve if you would believe in the best of your children, if you would believe in the best of your spouse. You would ima- you, you'd be surprised by how less enemies you would have and more new friends that you would have if you would just believe the best and everyone around you. And what we do is when we find ourselves in that place where we're believing in the best in those people, we find ourselves in a place we were in a community establishing what God has called us to do, and that's to see that the Gulf Coast is saved. The other thing that they do, the third thing that these encouragers do for us is they inspire us to keep on. Acts eleven twenty two through 23 says, news of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all of their hearts. And can I speak to your hearts in this room today? If you're in this room and you would find yourself in a place where you're experiencing any ounce of loneliness, where you experience any amount of defeat, loss, or any form of discouragement, that is not God's plan for you. That is far from God's plan for you. God's plan for you is to experience some Barnabases in your life. Someone that will inspire you to keep on, that will say, we have to decide now that we are going to serve God when times get rough, when times get tough. Fathers on on the Father's Day baptism that say, you know what, life may, may have been tough 
so far, life may, maybe I committed some of that. Maybe I have something to do with that. Maybe I wasn't the best father all of your life. But you know what, family? Today, what we're going to do on Father's Day is we're going we're gonna to go in the, the, the right direction. We're going to keep on. I'm going to baptize my spouse. I'm going to baptize my kids. And what's going to happen is you're going to find yourself in a place where you're leading your family in a place, inspiring your family to keep on in one of the most important parts of your relationship with Jesus. People going to Discover Coastal, keeping on regardless of the frustrating situation you had at your most recent church. Regardless of what the Christians that you faced in life and their hypocrisy and the things that they said to you and how they beat you down and how they made you feel somehow that God is angry with you. You keeping on, going to Discover Coastal, giving this church, giving some other Christians a chance that are trying to do it right, discovering your gifts. Or, realize, or having some confirmed that you're already aware about and being encouraged by the church to keep on operating in those gifts. That's dynamic encouragement, y'all. I'll illustrate it like this. Y'all know my infatuation and love for Fruity Pebbles. That's been made well apparent, okay? If you have seen an increase of purchases of Fruity Pebbles in your home, I'm sorry, not sorry, you're welcome, all right? You're welcome, okay? <laughs> and so what happens, you have to understand, this is not like something, this is not like an activity for me. And I, there's a reason that I have the keys coming up during this time, because this, this is important, y'all. And so what happens is, like, even when I went to the back of the last service, Margaret was like, Bryce, is it, is it that real? And I was like, oh, it's that real, okay? And so what happens is, I am very serious about my Fruity Pebbles. I have loved it from day one. And, and what happens when you're a three, four, five-year-old, you kind of just get what you want, right? I mean, you're cute, you're awesome, all that stuff. Well, in my situation especially, I was not just a normal, cute three, four, five-year-old. I was a very chubby, curly-haired, mixed three, four, five-year-old. And we really get what we want. <laughs> And I knew, like, I, I didn't even have to ask for anything. I knew when I went to my granny's house and my aunt's house in Texas, when we, we come in from out of town, they had in that closet, that pantry stocked full of Fruity Pebbles boxes, and that fridge was full of gallons of milk, all right? At that point in time in my life, it was whole milk. You know, I just had to, you know. And I remember, like, when I try to say I'm, I was serious about Fruity Pebbles, I mean, like, I was really serious. Like, every other, th- every other food I played around with, okay? I got messy all the table. Uh, I used to shove Pop-Tarts and VCRs. I mean, that's just, like, that's what it is. And so with Fruity Pebbles, I didn't play, though. I came to handle business. I had one bowl that I always used for Fruity Pebbles and Fruity Pebbles alone. I had one purple race car spoon that was only for Fruity Pebbles. I did not use that for anything else, okay? And it's just like each bite encouraged a thirst and hunger for more. Each bowl (laughs) encouraged more bowls, right? And it's just been this lifestyle that I've kind of just lived my whole life. I mean, it's literally an addiction. It might be a problem. If it is a sin, Jesus is going to have a heyday with me at the gates, y'all. I I mean, like, I just love that stuff. And I just keep on and keep on and keep on. And it just gets better every time. (laughs) Like, I really want to stop right now and have a bowl of Rudy Bevels. Like, (laughs) oh. But that's what happens when we keep on reading, too. Each read of the Bible, each verse, each chapter, it encourages more if you do it right. If you take it seriously. I can tell you right now, you can read through the Bible the whole year, and if you're not taking it seriously, if you're just reading it like it's books off pages, if you're reading it as if it's another homework assignment to pass and never look at, you will not find fulfillment in it. You have to dig deep with God's word. I'm just going to say right now, it is not easy. But it is incredibly encouraging. 
when you keep on reading the Bible, it, it just gets more encouraging. You get encouraged by Jesus. You start to connect to Jesus in a way that you never understood. When you keep on praying, you'll be encouraged even in your discouraging situations because you're trusting a God that is bigger than your discouraging situations. Even when you keep on investing your time into summer small groups and dinner clubs, being encouraged by people and the fact that the ways of Jesus cannot be lived alone but lived with each other. It's just dynamic encouragement. I'm going to talk about some people that have been encouraging in my life so that hopefully I hope this speaks to you, okay? And I'm, I'm going to go in order. There's no, like, I'm just going to go in order from day one here. And for me, obviously, it's my mom. I, and I, it was just me and her, and then my sisters came after that. My father was never there. And so my mom, I can honestly say, I don't ever remember a time in my life I'm literally being honest, 100% honest with you. I don't remember a time in my life where my mom made me feel like she didn't love me. I had a lot of emptiness on my father's side, but there's never a time in my life where I didn't feel like my mom loved me. And my mom, she, she worked her tail off for me. And you know, she, she would be at my games She'd be in my practices, and she would just be there. I, I just had this habit where I just wanted to look and see if she was there. And, and even when she wasn't there, I never doubted that she didn't want to be, or I never doubted that she wanted to be. I knew my mom always wanted to be there even if she couldn't. And the only reason that she couldn't be there wasn't because she was going on some date, wasn't because she was hanging out with friends, it was because she was working her tail off late night so not that I can just have okay shoes, so that I can have the best shoes, so that I can have clothes so I don't get made fun of in school, so that I can have endless amount of Rudy Pebbles. Like, that's what, I remember that. And that was so encouraging to me. When my mom's a Marine. We moved, we moved to Kansas City, got transferred there. There was a guy that I still call today Gunny Curry that was in her office. And Gunny Curry, he found out about me. My mom talked about me, and he knew that I was fatherless, and he allowed me to have an outlet that I did not have with my mom. He allowed me to be a boy. He allowed me to go outside and, 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 and play football and be messy and, and, and play in the snow and sled out there and go to Chiefs games and, 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 and wrestle. And I, and I couldn't wrestle my mom. She would have, she would have destroyed me anyway, but like, like I couldn't do that. And you know, when I was in college, I wanted to go play college football in Texas. And I remember we had a game in Lawrence, Kansas. And I remember... Gunny Curry had been dealing with leukemia and I called him just said, hey man, I, I know everything's kind of rough right now, but I'm going to be in Lawrence, Kansas and uh, dude, I just wish you could be there. He's like, Gunny, Curry, Gunny Curry told me he loved me. He's like, man, I'm wishing the best for you. And I go to the game and Gunny Curry is sitting in the stands by himself. It's cold. It's windy. He has no eyebrows. He has no hair. Um, his feet are so swollen that he has to wear hospital shoes. Yet he drove all the way to Lawrence, Kansas to watch me play a football game. And to this day, he has no clue how encouraging that was for me. He has no encouragement. To this day, he showed me how to truly value somebody, even though you may be going through the worst situation. M my wife, she helps me to see things that I don't see in myself. I mean, she just, she just sees these things, and, I, and, and I, I have a hard time grasping them sometimes, and she pushes me to that level. My wife understands fully that, like, when, I am, um, when I'm angry, it's not necessarily a matter of anger. It's more a situation of hunger, and um, she has a way of, like, switching that for me and recognizing that need and taking me to somewhere and uh, even though I will not admit it in conversations one-on-one, -on -one, she always says, um, you feel better? And I'm like, yeah, I do, I do. <laughs> Josh, the, the drummer here, he's the best man at my wedding. He's been there for me in a very tough situation that I had to go through in life. He's been there for me. And um, uh, there's a, an issue that I was just really dealing with uh, 
really bad out of high school, and he just kind of helped me with that, and we'd have nights. I'm just going to be open and honest with y'all. I don't even care what you think about me. We have moments where we just talk. We have moments where we're crying like girls, and then, like, next moment, we're on the way to Zaxby's to eat 20 hot wings and just sweat. Like, just, like, that's how we encouraged it, you know? He's a great financial example for me. He's willing to tell me when I'm being dumb with finances. Um, he is an awesome example of a husband that's dedicated. Um, my coastal students, adult and student volunteers, just, I'll, I'll be out this week. I'll be in San Antonio for a wedding and I won't be at service and I don't have a thing to worry about because they are truly the best leaders. That, that student ministry over there could run just fine without me because how awesome the adult and student leaders are at Coastal. There's just all these people in life that are encouraging. And if I can just be honest and transparent with you one more time for a moment, if you can receive this. Y'all know, some of you know that I had Bell's palsy and I, and I still have like a very small amount around this eye. And... Um, it was tough. Like my face was all like jacked up, looked like Two-Face and everything. And it just, it was weird. It was crazy. Um, lost a lot of sleep during that time. I was very exhausted. I was very frustrated. And I was very just annoyed with the situation. And a lot of you were extremely encouraging to me. Extremely encouraging. A lot of you came to bat for me, were supportive of me, and you were just amazing. And I thank you for that. You loved on me so much. But I honestly know at times because of how frustrated and annoyed I was with my situation, I know sometimes I seemed rushed. I know sometimes I seemed preoccupied. And what I fear sometimes is that sometimes I feel like I didn't value your encouragement. So number one, if that happened to you, I, wanna, I do wanna apologize. And I wanna let you know I appreciate all of your encouragement. But number, the other thing is about that, I wanna be transparent about that because I believe that's what some of us sometimes are dealing with. When it comes to the inspiration to keep on, some of us in this room, it's not the fact that we don't have encouragers around us. Some of us in this room, it's the fact that we're so frustrated with our situation that we cannot even receive the inspiration to keep on that's around us. It's there, but we're so consumed with our painful, frustrating, annoying, tough situation that we can't even hear the encouragers that are around us. That's not God's plan for you. God's plan for you is to have those people to help you keep on. As you continue to grow spiritually, grow with Coastal Church, you will find those type of encouragers in your life. The last thing that we wanna talk about is the point today as we close. Encouragers, these dynamic encouragers, they leave a legacy. Acts 4.37 says, he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. See, Barnabas was all, all in with Jesus. So much to the point that he's mentioned 25 times in the book of Acts and five more times in letters to New Testament churches. And he is the absolute depiction of the type of people that God wants us to be to others and the type of people that God wants in our lives people that support God's work in us, that believe the best in us, and that inspire us to keep on, to leave a legacy of dynamic encouragement. I want to pray with you today as you bow your heads. For some of us, it's uh, the only separating line right now between enjoying a life of dynamic encouragement and not living that life and enjoying that life. It's, it's the fact that we're, we're not experiencing the greatest encouragement of all. The fact that Jesus died for us on the cross for our sins. That we don't, he did that without requirement. He did that because he wanted to. He did that because he is the ultimate encourager. He did that because he knew we needed it, even if we don't want it. And he, he finds himself in this place on the cross offering this to us regardless of our performance, regardless of our attitude, regardless of our selfishness, 
regardless of our sins and how filthy we may be, regardless of our mistakes, because all of us have been in that place. We were so far gone from Jesus. Every single person in this room has been in that place. That is how we all started this life, so far from Jesus. And he knew it was gonna be that way and he still did that for us. That alone is the ultimate encouragement. That alone. And even when we decide to follow him, we're still prone to mistakes. He knows that. We're still prone to do stupid things sometimes. He knows that. We're still prone to be human. Yet he loves us so much that he wants to offer us the power of the cross, the encouragement of a lifetime, the encouragement for forever. He wants to offer that to us because he loves us that much. And today, for some of you, the separation between experiencing all this today, all of this encouragement, that can only be found in Jesus. Yes, and I want to stop you if you're thinking this, well, what about the Christians that don't act like that? Well, to be honest with you, I question a lot of that Christianity. I'm just going to say that. There are very real people that love Jesus, that have his encouragement in mind, that claim him the right way, that honor his name, that doesn't disrespect what he stands for that he wants you to experience in your life. Ultimately, he wants to offer you his encouragement to you directly as you read his word, as you talk to him. Not living perfectly, but just connecting with him and growing with him. And if today you wanna experience that, you would say, you know what, I've never made that decision before. Or I've made that decision before, but as I look at my life, literally nothing has changed. I am the same person that said, Jesus, I wanna follow you. Jesus, I wanna give my life to you. I am that same person. Right now, there's no condemnation, there's no shame, there's only love and encouragement that Jesus wants to offer you. If you're one of those two people, you wanna give your life to Jesus for the first time or rededicate your life to him, can you just lift your hand as no one looks around? I don't wanna disrespect anybody. If that's you today, yes, thank you, thank you. Anybody else, thank you, thank you. Yes, yes, see that hand, thank you. I wanna pray for you today. There's... Even if you didn't say, if you didn't lift your hand, I want everybody, I see that hand. I want everybody to repeat this prayer after me, okay? I want you to say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. But you already knew that. And today, I give my life to you. I ask you to come into my heart to wash me clean and to show me how to live for you. As I read your word and as I talk to you, And as I surround myself with dynamic encouragers, I believe that you died on the cross for my sins and that you rose again. I love you and I thank you. And everybody said, amen. Come on, Coastal Church, let's give it up for all the people that gave their life to Jesus. That is the best decision you'll ever make in your life. And uh, we just love you so much.